you will experience so much more financial control and profitability when you incorporate infinite banking into whatever it is that you are doing or will do with real estate. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents channel. My name is Jesse Durham. For today's life lesson, we're going to dive in on land. Now, that just means real estate in general. We're going to be discussing different aspects of overlap and interplay between implementing the infinite banking concept as described in R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, and renting, buying, all things real estate. So we've been in this life lessons series where we've been discussing things like legacy, things that we do for leisure, leveraging your liabilities. And now we're at land. And I just want to remind us that the properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends is the ideal financial asset, period, bar none. And this asset is what could be used as a private banking entity. Well, we all interact with land in one way or another, and I just want to help expand our thinking on when, how, if you could implement infinite banking in that aspect of your life. Again, it could play into things that we have already covered, like legacy, intergenerational planning and acting. It could cover things like leisure. We've recently talked about financing vacations using your policy or system of policies. Getting out of debt, that was our leveraging liabilities life lesson. But here we are at land. Let's begin by discussing renting. So if you are renting... Perhaps you're in a position that you're looking ahead to buying for one. So when you realize that, yes, it would behoove us to capitalize, it would behoove us to save money somewhere. Of course, we've already discussed the properly structured policy as the ideal asset to be able to come up with a down payment in the future, for example. So once you realize that it does behoove you to become your own banker, to capitalize somewhere where you have ownership and control and guarantees and a death benefit at the back end and all the different aspects that makes a policy for the banking purpose, the ideal asset, you should consider what you could do where you're at at the same time. So perhaps you're building up and you're saving for long range your own place. That means coming up with a 3%, maybe a 20%, whatever you choose, down payment. We'll talk more about that in a second. But I've had discussions with folks about even doing something along the lines of building up enough capital in a policy to be able to go to their landlord and ask for a discount by paying cash up front for a whole year at a time and maybe knock a month or two off of the price by being able to pay cash up front ahead of time. So again, when you're implementing the infinite banking concept, you're accounting for the golden rule. And the golden rule says that he who has the gold makes the rule. See, if you capitalize a system that allows you to walk up to your landlord and say, hey, I'd like to just go ahead and pay next year's up front. What could we do? Can we come to an agreement on a discounted price for the rent? Because you're going to pay cash up front. Money talks, people say. That's the saying, right? So that's just one way where I know folks that do exactly that right there. And that's how they use infinite banking in their lifestyle, in their, in their life, in their living situation. But that's one way. And it's a powerful position to be in. The other way, of course, is if you are looking to buy, you're going to be coming up with a down payment. Knowing what you know about infinite banking, this is... A good opportunity for me to quiz you a little bit and I'm going to say there's no right or wrong answer per se. There may be a more mathematically beneficial answer but money's not all about math. That's why Nelson starts with the human problems in his book Becoming Your Own Banker because he recognizes that and we should too if we want to have success. But knowing what you know about capital, having the use of it, banking, and maybe you don't know a bunch, and this is a good good question for you to consider right at the start of your journey as well. A 15-year mortgage or a 30-year mortgage? And again, I'm not telling you which one is best for you. There are those out there, that blanket statement across the board. They're going to say 15 fixed rate, very, uh, a 15-year mortgage, fixed rate, etc. Right? While I know folks also that pay interest only, 
30-year mortgages. While I've read books, let me keep going since I'm here. While I've read books of folks who will promote the idea, not always, but it may benefit you to have this as an option, to use a reverse mortgage strategically. So I'm just saying it's really interesting to consider. But when you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. That's my firm belief. That's the philosophy that I have for my own implementation of the infinite banking concept and most everything else, I guess, I suppose, but also for helping prospective clients and clients implement the infinite banking concept. When you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. So when I ask, well, would you rather have a 15 year or a 30 year mortgage? There are plenty of folks that say, oh, 15 years for sure. I want to pay that thing off super fast because I don't want to pay so much interest. And you're right. Mathematically, there is that. Also, mathematically, there is this. If you did a 30-year mortgage, would you still have the option of paying it off twice as fast? Sure, you would. But also, if you know what to do with capital, is there something that you, you, can think of that you would do with the difference? What if you had a 30-year mortgage and you, quote-unquote, paid as if it were a 15, but you really only sent the regular mortgage payment in and you did something with the other equal payment. What could you do with money? Could you come out on top mathematically if you know what to do with money, even if you're only paying a 30-year mortgage and still get it paid off sooner? I think you could, but that's for you to arrive at knowing and understanding and implementing whichever way you want. Again, I'm not saying one's worse than the other, one's bad, one's good. I'm saying you should be your own banker. You should be in control of the banking function in your life, no matter which route you take. So when it does come to procuring a house, though, for you, again, we could ask the same question about the mortgage for the down payment would you rather put a 3% down payment down or a 20% to be able to avoid the PMI, the private mortgage insurance? And there again, there are going to be a plenty of folks that are going to say, well, I want to come up with 20% down because that's going to save me so much interest that I otherwise would have paid. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. At the same time, if you put 3% down, could you pay extra later if you wanted? Yes. Also, do you know what you would do with the difference? Also, for example, on the down payment, let's say it was a $100,000 mortgage. I know that's, but it's simple math that I can do in my head. Okay. So a 20% down payment would be $20,000. A 3% down payment would be $3,000. Well, if you went the route of paying $3,000, but you had been proactive, you had been intentional, you had been purposeful, you'd actually saved up 20%. You could have paid 20%, but you decided to pay 3% because you knew of something that you could do with that 17 other thousand dollars that would offset the cost of the private mortgage insurance. So again, both of those scenarios can be great scenarios. Which one makes sense for you, I think is a valid question. And at the end of the day, I'm asking who controls the banking function in your life when it comes to renting, when it comes to mortgages, when it comes to down payments. And if you systematically build out your strength and ability in banking privately for yourself, you eventually land at land, okay, pun intended there, I guess. It just flows naturally from, from me. You land at land to where you can implement infinite banking in your renting scenario, in your home purchase scenario, so that you have control, so that you have the profitability that otherwise the commercial banks would be experiencing. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to be the one in control? To be the one calling the shots. And here for, for the down payment, one more thing on the down payment. When it comes to setting aside money, I've already encouraged you to consider where. A whole life policy is the ideal financial asset for your privatized banking. And when it comes to down payments, Consider this. Consider the efficiency of your dollars. How many jobs can you get the same dollars to perform? Well, if you set aside whatever number you choose, 3%, 10%, 20%, whatever the number is, and you pay that towards the home, how efficient were those dollars? Well, how many jobs did they accomplish? One. You paid those dollars for the down payment for the home. You got the home. One job. 
Okay. What if instead you know you want to buy, so you proactively build capital in a privatized banking entity, your whole life policy, and you use your policy for the down payment. You leverage your policy. You take a policy loan and you put that 3% down or that 20% down just like you would have otherwise. But because you capitalized in that policy, you procured for yourself a death benefit. You're growing and compounding the premium dollars that you paid. You have this system where you can begin to recapture interest that otherwise would have gone to other people. You have so much working for you when it comes to control and profitability, where otherwise, folks, they save money, they save more money, they save more money, and they liquidate it. It goes down to zero. They put down the 3% or the 20%, whichever number they chose, they liquidate it and they have nothing to show for it other than the house. So I'm saying, what if you could get the house? What if you could put the down payment on the house that you want and you had a private banking entity uh, self-collateralizing, appreciating asset also? What if you could do both? You can. All right, so let's say you're exposed to this infinite banking concept and you already have a mortgage. Okay, I'm going to encourage you, pull out your your statement, okay, and look, just look at last month, how much money, not the rate, I'm not asking you about the rate, how many dollars, how much money, what was the volume of interest paid last month? Okay, so out of your payment, how much went to principal? And how much went to interest. And look at that percentage-wise. Percentage-wise. Because, see, on, on a mortgage, in the beginning, the vast, vast, vast majority of your payment, almost all of it, is going towards interest alone. For years and years and years, it's that way. And if you look, most people, when do most people move? Five years? Seven years? Something around there, right? Well, if you refinance or if you move, you do any of those things, you you start all over. So you're creating a constant and perpetual cash cow for the banks, okay? Because you are just bleeding out interest. And look at Nash's annual spending pattern. Here's a good opportunity to, to remind ourselves what's in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, on the annual spending pattern of the average All-American. Well, we're bleeding out about 34.5% of every dollar that we earn in interest alone. And the bigger portion of that comes from our housing, whatever that situation may be. It's from housing. So I'm just going to encourage you. You look at you. You. You look at your numbers. How much did you pay last month? How much are you going to pay next month? So what if you could keep that? That's where we're getting to. What if you could keep that? And listen, I'm on the phone with folks, interestingly enough, who say, Jesse, but folks shouldn't be paying off their mortgage and they should be using their money from policies for other things. Well, I'm not going to take the stance of telling anybody what they should do. I'm here to encourage you to be your own banker. And here's how I view it. No matter which scenario you're in, if you're implementing infinite banking and you do decide to use your policy to pay off your home early and you recapture the interest dollars that otherwise would have gone to the bank, is that bad? Oh, no, you're blowing by the average American. Because remember, compared to what? All right, these are words from Nash. Compared to what? If the average American is bleeding out interest dollars on their home mortgage and you you implement infinite banking and you're recapturing that interest, that remember, it's like the airplane. The airplane doesn't operate in a vacuum. The average American is going backwards hundreds of miles per hour. You're going forwards hundreds of miles per hour. But what's that difference compared to what? They're screaming this way. You're screaming this way. Okay. Compared to what? It's not a bad scenario. But sure, are there plenty of folks, lots of business owners would be one example, who could possibly better use their capital in their business instead of paying off a mortgage? They keep that liquidity. They keep sure. But at the end of the day, compared to what? If you're implementing infinite banking and you're being an honest banker, you're blowing past the competition. There's no comparison. So I'm encouraging you to look at the volume of interest that you pay each month on your mortgage. Look at the percentage that that represents of your monthly cash flow. What percentage 
of your income, your cash flows each, each month, is represented in money that's just, it's never coming back to you. It's leaving you forever. How much? And then, yes, when you look at how often folks refinance or how often folks move, you're just starting that process all over. And then doesn't that happen generation to generation? If you haven't seen it yet, I would encourage you to check out my life lesson on legacy. Most generations are starting from scratch. What if it didn't have to be that way? What if you could recapture all the interest dollars that you would have otherwise paid out for a mortgage and then that puts the next generation at a completely different starting point? Completely different. So again, I'll throw up some visuals here where I was on the phone recently with someone and we were going through these numbers, their their mortgage, what the rate was, how long they'd been in the home. And we broke down those numbers where we looked at what their total payment was, how much of that was going towards interest only. It's just staggering, folks. And I did a couple of things here to illustrate the difference between the portion of your payment that goes towards interest, the portion of your payment that goes towards the actual principal mortgage itself. It is a decreasing amount. And there are some really neat visuals here that diagram the the lion's share, of course, is is interest. So on the point of mortgage, you know, this may be a, a pausing moment for you where you consider, is there a way for us to change from a 15 to a 30 year? Does that make sense for you? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you this isn't advice, but when you understand what's going on, you'll know what to do. Again, I'm saying that. I am saying that. What if you could have access to more of your cash flows on a monthly basis? Could you do things that would offset the the closing costs and the refinancing costs, et cetera? That's for you to figure out. Should you be making extra payments? I'm encouraging you to be your own banker. I would say no extra payments unless they come from a policy. I would I would absolutely consider what it would look like if I made my dollars more efficient. Each dollar is accomplishing multiple jobs before it leaves our household. And then we can even transition into what if we took this static investment, a home, not an asset. Notice I said investment. Robert Kiyosaki says most people think their home is their greatest asset, and it possibly could be an asset, possibly. But there are lots of factors to consider. But for sure, it's an investment. What if you could take equity from this static investment, the bricks, the two by fours, and strategically place some of that where it could compound, have tax advantages, be more accessible, liquid, where you could account for inflation and other things. So here I'm going to use a visual to show what that could look like. So here you are, and you're doing business with the bank. The bank holds the mortgage on your home. You pay the bank for the mortgage. The collateral in this relationship is the home itself. And as you continue to make payments, you create equity in the home. Well, the question is, what if you accessed some of that equity and you strategically place those dollars in a properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividend. Again, folks, this is just a possible scenario. This is just one way that folks have used infinite banking. I'm not saying that this is the place to start. I believe, in fact, that the place to start implementing infinite banking is from your cash flows. It's not from static assets and other locations, but this is possible for you to redirect dollars, equity in a home, to a policy via premiums. You pay policy premiums. So you're transferring that capital from one entity to another one. This one creates a better equity. You have a contractual right to access equity in a policy. You had to ask permission. You had to go through paperwork. I mean, there would be some things that you would have to do to get to the equity in your home with a commercial bank that you just wouldn't have to. I mean, when you want to access equity in your in your policy, you call the company up or you log into your portal 
and they send you a check or they make a direct deposit okay, against the cash values that you have in your policy. There are tons of tax advantages. Of course, with a policy, you're getting tax-free access to capital. The death benefit is going to eventually be paid tax-free. That's a tax-free windfall to your heirs or beneficiaries. There's compound growth in the policy. It is a self-collateralizing asset. So this asset provides its own collateral and its own access to guaranteed compounding capital at the same time. The death benefit is the collateral for the policy loans. And again, it can't be overstated. Contractual right to access capital. Well, the money that you can access via policy loans can then, of course, be used to pay back this HELOC, this home equity line of credit example that I'm that I'm showing here. So it's just a way for you to be able to reallocate inefficient static capital into a more active advantageous asset and be an honest banker, re repay of course the the bank HELOC while you're building up capital in the policy because the policy is just contractually guaranteed going to become more and more efficient over time. So again, this scenario that I'm laying out here, you could incorporate a HELOC into an existing policy. You may start a brand new policy if you're wanting to use a HELOC. So this is on a case by case basis, person by person basis. This is not for everybody. This is not the place to start necessarily, in my opinion. With infinite banking, it should start with your cash flows before you get to incorporating other assets and such. But it's also the infinite banking concept. This is something that's possible and that's done and that it's advantageous for you. Now, if you own your own home, and this is the situation that my wife and I happen to be in at the time of this recording. We own our own home and land and property. No mortgage on that. But perhaps you have these items on your plate. So perhaps you're looking at building an addition. Perhaps you want to do a remodel, renovation. Perhaps you need a new. Does this sound familiar, anybody? In my home, where my homeowner's at, it's time for a new roof. You need a new well dug, septic system put in, HVAC, hardwood floors, furniture, appliances, hot water heater, etc. Other improvements. Perhaps you want to build a barn. You want to build a shed. You want to build a kennel. You want to build a shop, a garage, greenhouse. Fill in the blank. My landowners, you, you know, you know, you always have something else that you want to do or that you need to do. It's just the nature of it. And again, when you realize that everything is financed and if you don't want to have to go to a bank and ask for permission and then bleed out interest dollars to them for what you've asked for and you want to be able to do that for yourself, I'm going to encourage you to become your own banker when it comes to these aspects. When you want to make improvements on what you already own because you're not making a mortgage payment, your capital must reside somewhere. I believe it should reside in a private asset that you own and control. And then, of course, you can uh, do the financing yourself for these things. So you can do those things. You can get the renovation. You can build the barn and you can get the money back. You can keep the money that you've capitalized into your system leverage that system to do the things that you were going to do anyway. And look at that. You've not changed your cash flows. You've not worked any harder. You've not taken any additional risks. You've not lost control. You're enjoying the control and the profitability of this scenario. Now, here's a quick picture of me. Uh, did I take this picture and did I use a policy loan just to be able to say that we'd replaced an appliance when a washing machine went out? Yes, I did. The wash I didn't want the washing machine to go out, but if it was going to go out, I wasn't going to miss out on an opportunity just to be able to say that we'd taken care of that appliance that we needed that we were going to replace anyway with a policy loan. But here are some other real life examples. Again, I, I try to be as open of a book as possible and share my best practices and experiences. So back 2017, 2018, a few years ago, at the time of the recording now, my wife and I spent several, several thousand dollars on some renovations. We did some things in the living room, some things upstairs. We just, we had a lot going on. We actually did a lot. And here, I, looking back now, it's so neat that I did this at the time. I was just trying to track 
the expenses on labor and the expenses on supplies just for our own bookkeeping purposes, just to keep tabs on things. And and now looking back, because I help people professionally with the infinite banking concept, it's just pretty cool to be able to show and share with folks how we used infinite banking for things like redoing the the, the fireplace in our our living room, some some tile work there and doing some work in our in our laundry room and just all these other putting down some flooring just some neat things that we decided to do and we used our system of policies at the time we would have had we would have had our first two policies for sure so we transitioned from paying off debt to doing things like financing family vacations and financing home renovations and again it, it was several thousand dollars it was a big deal for us at the time several thousand dollars went to that home renovation and we used our private banking system to be able to to do that now let's get to investment properties so there are investors out there that are wondering how this could apply to what it is that you're already doing. So number one, my question to you is, where's your bank? All right, where are you? Who are you doing your banking business with? Because banking is a business. Everything's financed, including real estate investments. OK, if you sell a property, where do you put the money? Now, I know plenty of you are going to say well, into another property. I understand that. Don't you have that deposited in a bank, though? And if you're collecting rents and different things, it doesn't that go into a bank. So it's it's going into someone else's business is what I'm trying to get you to notice. OK, and there is profitability there. I understand you want to move it into another property as soon as possible. But banking is taking place. At, but you're not in that business if you've not implemented infinite banking yet. That's just the commercial banking system profiting from what you're doing in the real estate world. OK, I'm saying you can add one step to what you're already doing. And you can be in both worlds. You can exponentially increase your profitability by becoming your own banker, even when it comes to your real estate investments. So think about where you're warehousing your wealth, where you're doing your banking, because you could own that. You could control that and you could profit from that. If you do think about how much the, the bank is making off of your business, it's it's incredible. We would be happy and the, the 20, 20% mark, for example, 20% is is a pretty staple mark for, for lots of areas, lots of things in, in the real estate world. Well, do you know that banks are making 400% on every dollar that you put into the bank? Do you know that they're making 1,200% on the dollars that we're putting into the bank? Okay. When you understand what the banks are doing, and you realize that you could be doing that for yourself, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Without banking, every other business would come to a screeching halt. Think about that and realize that you could do it for yourself. So what if you could just take that one step to what you're already doing, not change your cash flows, not take any additional risk, not lose control, not work any harder, and you could be your own banker. And it, it really doesn't matter if you're a conventional business. I've got a diagram here showing how conventional financing works. If you're a business, you're just thinking about payroll and, and rent and, and your taxes and, and those types of things while the bank is making bank. Whereas privatized business means that you're the banker. So you enjoy the control. You enjoy the profitability. So real estate investing is not the starting point for everyone. If you've not implemented infinite banking into your own private life, I'm going to encourage you to start there. And then, of course, you can grow and scale that out to the other things that you're doing like business, like investing for sure. But again, for everyone, where's your bank? OK, the local credit union or bank in, in your town, just like I have in my town. Is that yours? No. So I think the place to start then is in your own private, personal life, capitalizing a privatized banking system that you own and control. And then starting where it makes sense for you to start, whether you're renting, whether you're saving up a down payment for a home, whether you already have a mortgage, whether you're in the real estate investing space or you want to be in the real estate investing space. Maybe you want to do private lending. Maybe you want to do wholesaling. Maybe you want to have operating capital for uh, multifamilies and you want to build a portfolio. So whatever the case may be, just understand that everything's financed. 
including real estate. Just understand that banking is a business and you could do the banking for yourself. And where location, location, location is touted to be the most important thing when it comes to real estate. Again, I'm going to say without banking, business comes to a screeching halt. I've got a better one for you. What about banking, banking, banking? So banking takes place on good deals and bad deals. Have you thought about that? Have you ever had a deal go bad for you? Well, the bank still does well. Whether whether the deal went well or not, banks still do well. So banks win on good deals and bad deals for your real estate investments. They're making bank, and you can too. And at the end of the day, I'm encouraging you to consider, to vet, to research, and to implement becoming your own banker. I think it's the most profitable thing that you could choose to do. R. Nelson Nash said it so years ago. I've experienced that for my own self. I'm not done. It keeps getting better. I'm still on my journey, but we've implemented this concept for the better part of a decade, and it's touched all these different aspects in, in our own life from how we have our household set up, how we do our private finances, all the way to we've made some real estate investments. I was looking at a property just this week. I've been on the phone about a property just this week because implementing infinite banking has opened up lots of doors for us, lots of opportunities for us. And in fact, Nash says this in his book. He says, when you implement infinite banking, when you when you account for the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules, when you capitalize, opportunities will hunt you down. Now, some, some, some say that you've got to go look for opportunities. I understand both of those perspectives. But what I know is that I would rather have the money when an opportunity comes than have an opportunity come and have to acquire the money. Okay. So we, we've, we've enjoyed some real estate opportunities ourselves here's a picture of me and our two boys where we had gone on site for a deal that uh, we made happen a while back and of course i set it up because of how i view family banking how i view infinite banking as a as a family a family work uh, they were able to enjoy the profitability from that real estate transaction with me so again folks i'm going to encourage you that if you have any questions, put them down in the comment section below. I do see those. I do answer those myself. If you'd like to have a private conversation about what it could look like for you to implement infinite banking into your household or your business or your investing, then don't hesitate to reach out to me. I do have a free introductory presentation on our website and my calendar link. That's at durhamtalents.com. But this has been a great pleasure for me. I'm encouraging you to live and leave a lasting legacy. I look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day. Take care.